Om Aganati Marandasyam Ganagana Salakya Chaksurun Meritam Yanatashmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Sapitam Yanabhutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Dharati Swaparantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamanam Sri Gurun Vaishnavam Sya Sri Rupam Sagaradam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savarutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Paran Sahagana Larita Shri Vishikan Vitam Sham He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandha Jigapate Gopisha Gopika Kantara Dekantana Mostute Jayatam Surato Pango Mama Mandir Matirgati Matsavasya Param Boja Radha Ramadana Mohanam Sri Man Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsi Vena Karsan Vena Sanopika Kopanata Sri Sanam Divyad Vrindyanan Yakapadrumada Sri Madhadakara Shema Sanishto Sri Sri Radha Shira Govinda Deva Prasada Vihi Seva Manish Marami Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Chajigari Taya Krishnaya Go Vinaya Namo Namaha Mangalang Bhagavan Mishnu Mangalam Guru Dajitam Mangalam Paririkaksho Mangalaya Tanohari Om Narayanaya Vidmahi Vasudevaya Dimahi Tano Vishnu Pachodiyate Om Mahadevi Chavidmahi Vishnu Padnita Dimahi Tano Lakshmi Pachodiyate Mahalakshmi Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Sare Sare Hari Priya Namastubhyam Namastubhyam Sare Sare Sarta Kanchana Gonagi Rari Vindavanishwari Vishabhana Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priya Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Dev Maheshwara Guru Shaksha Parabharam Tashmai Sri Guru Venma Durga Me Pati Me Andasha Skarapate Garamuru Shakri Paisanan Santu Santu Varam Varam Mukham Kavit Vakariyan Sabarishanani Panga Gilanga Nade Katarigani Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutare Shumari Bhakti Varanta Shami Tanamani Maste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pacharini Nirvishesa Sunivari Paskita Deasana Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vinnam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Welcome Natasha Brent and a number of other people who haven't commented yet to Transcendental Tuesday. We've been putting as our background virtual screen the last couple of days our lake here at New Kusham Sarovar. We are called New Kusham Sarovar because we're modeled after the original Kusham Sarovar in uh, Govardhan, India. The name literally translates to mean temple and a lake of flowers. So we can't lay claim to New Kusham Sarovar without having beside our temple a lake which has flowers. You'll see the water lilies and the lotuses. Um, and it also is stocked full of fish as well, brightly colored orange and yellow, silver, koi. Um, we ha we've had a seagull who's discovered our pond lately and he comes morning and evening for a meal. He circles, identifies one of the smaller fish and swoops down, takes him away for his meal. We're trying to figure out what we can do to discourage that sea seagull from stealing Krishna's fish. Can't imagine the shock where fish is happily swimming in the temple lake amongst his fellow fish and all of a sudden from above a beak comes and squeezes him and lifts him out of water his natural environment and before he knows it he's 50 60 70 feet above the water and separated from his fellows and we're trying to figure out what we can do to save our dependence here from such a fate Seville's got to eat, that's true, he's also one of God's creatures, but I don't feel it's my duty to feed the seagull as much as it is to save the fishes. <laughs> My Bobby's here, I don't know if she's going to post a comment on that or not. Uh, good morning, Janatari, got fire sacrifice to finalize her Brahmin initiation on Sunday. Britta, good morning, Hare Krishna, Govinda Dev who led an incredible kirtan last Saturday night at the Salt Lake City Temple. Anjali called it a flamenco kirtan. Brent, Natasha. We're um, diving into the second part of what's 
could promise us to be an extended series on fearlessness. That's something we can talk about a lot, right? Yesterday we talked about the main difference between the material world and the spiritual world. Start contrasting difference. You know, if, anything, if anything was black and white, either or, this is it. Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the difference between earth and heaven. And in and, and heaven, the Lord's will is done. Everyone shelters under the protection of the Lord. And because he's known as Maha Baho, mighty armed, he's within each and every atom. He's in the hearts of all living beings. There isn't a, there isn't a, a, a dust particle in this material or spiritual world in which the Lord is not personally and fully and a hundred percent present. And so those who follow His orders take shelter of Him by following His orders have no fear whatsoever. But in this material world, hardly anyone follows the orders of the Lord. They follow the orders of their senses, the mind the emotions, and they go awry from the better plan of the Lord for their lives. And the result is they're full of fear, living sh shot through with fear, stress, and anxiety. So the difference between the material world and the spiritual world is that wherever you go in the vastness of the spiritual world, wherever you meet, you'll not find anyone who has the slightest bit of fear. There might be Fear on the transcendental platform. Fear of um, not making the flower go into Krishna's um, taste, or fear of maybe not making the best dance presentation, or um, fear that when you present your cooked offering to the higher up devotees of the Lord, they may not find it 100% to their liking. Those kinds of fears are actually. A, a covering for ecstasy. When the emotions are purified, they're free from what Prabhupada called material inebriates, material contaminations, the emotions, which are ne generally negative in the material world, become positive. They become a different flavor of ecstasy. Even emotions like ghastliness, um, fear, once they're free of their material counterparts are catalysts, impulses, inspiration for higher ecstatic states of consciousness. But when we talk about fear being rife within this material world, it's an entirely different thing than the transcendental fear that exists in the spiritual world. Fear of this material world is a killer. It gives strokes. It gives heart attacks. It raises your blood pressure. It thickens your blood and causes your cholesterol to rise. It re re reduces the quality of your life, enters into every single part of your life and makes life tough going. Dur Durga. Lord Brahma has another beautiful verse here <laughs> in the third canto of the Bhagavatam. Lord Brahma's laying it out for us. And of course, if you think there's some merit within this material world, you think there's some redeeming qualities and the result will be that you'll conclude, well, it's not so bad and, and thus uh, prolong your sojourn, sojourn in this world of birth, death, disease, and old age. Continue to muck around, continue to hope against hope that you'll get some pleasure within this material world. And so Lord Brahm is the original spiritual master, both in yesterday's verses and today's verses. He tries to divest us of any hopes for material happiness and peace in this atmosphere. And the, his purpose is not spoiling the party, but he's trying to get us out of the material atmosphere in order to get us someplace much, much better. So here's another one of those upbeat verses from Lord Brahma, third canto, ninth chapter, six verse. Tavad Bayam, Dravina Deha Surin Nimitam, says in this material world, people are embarrassed by material anxieties, they're essentially embarrassed by these bodies. We see these prisoners on the side of the road. There's a prison van and there's a prison guard and the prisoners are all wearing these jumpsuits. They used to be striped. They used to be striped to show that these were members of the what was known in the old days as the chain gang. Now, 
ironically, <laughs> prisoners wear mostly the saffron color, which is the same color that the sannyasis and swamis wear in our culture. Uh, no, no negative reflection on the sannyasis or karma. Anyway, you see along the side of the road the prisoners in their orange jump shoots with a, you know, county jail written on the back. So they've got to be embarrassed going around being forced to wear those orange jumpsuits, which identify them as outlaws, as criminals, of people of lesser intelligence. Similarly, Lord Brahma, from his point of view, all embodied living beings, if you've got a material body, folks, even if you've got the body of the president or the richest person in the world or the, the most coveted beauty star or the gold medaled athlete, um, you should be embarrassed by having assumed a material body because you have your original, eternal, self effulgent spiritual form. Seventh canto says, Deesh tu sarvasangato jagatu shura atrivak neti neti atrivak The embodied living beings, we actually have two bodies apart from our original spiritual form. We have two levels of material bodies and they both cover the spiritual shorup, the spiritual spiritual form. It's like in winter, you might have an overcoat against the excessive chill, and then you might have your normal shirt. And then there's you. Deyash tu sarva sangato, deyash tu sarva jagat From this material world, which is composed of five gross elements and three subtle elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether, these comprise your overcoat, your gross outer covering then the three material kamano buddha deva cha hankara, body, mind, um, mind, intelligence, and false ego, these comprise your second material covering, which is like your shirt. Then within the gross body, earth, air, fire, water, ether, and yet within still the subtle body, the shirt made of mind, intelligence, false ego, there is the soul. It says, neti neti achachina. So one's got to sort through all the material elements. I'm not earth, I'm not air, I'm not fire, I'm not false ego, I'm not mine, I'm not this body. And finally, distill everything down to the real point, which is that one is eternal spirit soul. And as a spirit soul, as a fully realized spiritual soul, there's really nothing to be afraid of. Whatever comes against you, it's temporary. It may affect your body, it may affect your mind if you let it, but nothing can affect the soul. Nothing to affect the soul. Soul is unaffected. For instance, the examples given in the Bhagavatam, you see your head cut off. You see your head cut off. You can't see your head cut off because if your head was cut off, you couldn't see, right? So when you see your head cut off, it's obviously not true, isn't it? You can't see your head being cut off in reality. Now, if you're seeing your head cut off, it's some kind of a crazy drug-induced nightmare or dream, or it may not be drug-induced. But it's definitely not reality. So whatever sufferings we think we are feeling are not real, factually speaking. You may see your head cut off in a dream, and it may be very disconcerting. I mean, very, very terrifying to you. You imagine seeing your head cut off, put you in a total state of stress and anxiety, but it's not real. On one level, you have to know it's not real. Because you cannot see your head cut off. If your head was cut off, you would lose all vision. Your eyes wouldn't work anymore. So when we see our head cut off, we can take consolation from the fact that this is a dream. It's not real. So birth, death, disease, and old age, hunger, thirst, all the anxieties that adhere to a material body, gross and subtle, are false. They're illusory. When we chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, and wake up to our own eternality, all the miseries of this material world will go away like that. When you're dreaming, it seems like what you're dreaming about is very real. 
You, you forget that you're lying down in a comfortable bed in Spanish Fork, Utah. Instead, you dream you're being approached by a tiger. In the dream, you're terrified. Even in your bed, you're starting to sweat. You're starting to thrash around and getting entangled in the covers. But um, if someone comes to your bedside and says, Chiru, 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 wake up, you're just dreaming. As soon as you wake up, all, all the tiger, the jungle, the palp, everything goes away. And then it seems, as real as it seemed while it was happening, as soon as you wake up, it seemed insubstantial. And while it was happening, it might have seemed like it was lasting forever. Tigers coming towards you from a distance, inch by inch, slowly, slowly. You've got ice water in your veins. You're paralyzed by the hypnotic stare of the tiger, its yellowish eyes, its whiskers twitching, its tongue licking its lips in anticipation of a good meal. All that plays out, plays out. A tiger comes towards you. Seems like he takes forever. He's coming inch by inch by inch by inch. So during the dream, it may seem to have taken ages. And yet when you wake up, you realize that it, it was only a matter of a few seconds that you're in that dreamlike state. And, and not only do you dismiss it immediately and file it away under things that are unreal, but you forget it. It says all the miseries, all the reincarnations, all the changes of body that we experience and have experienced since time immemorial in this material world. But when we wake up to our own spiritual selves, full of eternity, knowledge, and bliss, they seem insignificant, insubstantial. There was no reality to them. I did not suffer. It was only because I misidentified with this body that needlessly I saw my head being cut off. I put myself into a state of fear and anxiety. But from an objective point of view, there's nothing to be anxious about. There's nothing to be fearful about. God made sure of that when he created you. He created you in such a way that you need never fear. You created fear. God didn't create fear. God created you eternal. Not to evaham jitu nasham natum nimajin nechayba bhumanisham sarabhayavata. Krishna says to Arjuna, never, never, N-E-V-E-R, capital letters, means it means never. <laughs> Was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings are in the future, for it was me? What are the specifics that? Najayate, mriyate, bakadachim, nayam bhutpa, naboy, ajo, nitjo, shashvato, yam harano, nahanyate, hanyamane, sirir. The soul is unborn, eternal, primeval. Nahanyate, hanyame. The soul is not slain when the body is slain. Reminds me of my rap song. You cannot kill, nor can you die. You cannot burn, nor can you fry. The soul cannot be scorched by any blaze. No water can drown the spirit. No wind can make it fade. You cannot cut another, nor can you bleed. The soul is eternal, unborn, a seed, indivisible, indestructible, forever free from birth, death, old age, and disease. Yet, howsoever turned or tossed, the soul can never exhaust. Seated in the heart, beating its drum. Uh, powering everyone, the soul's superior force lives on and runs its endless course in God's unlimited universe. As the cloud supports the air, as the air supports the cloud, as so spirit supports the flesh, take away the living force, it's just chemicals lying there, a corpse naked and bare. Not a twitch or wiggle, not a subtle wink or giggle, can't tickle it or puzzle it with a riddle, deaf, blind, mute, dumb, numb, can't reward it, can't ignore it, can't restore it. Deader than a doornail, stiffer than a born. Only thing to return it, burn it, bury it, earth to earth, uh, dust to dust, ash to ashes. Infirm body versus immortal soul. Learn the difference, conquering us, make a spiritual choice. Sing out, give voice, rejoice, make some noise for the spiritual force. Anjali's heard me do that song on stage for the Festival of Colors. The point is that soul was made by our loving Father indestructible from the very beginning. He blessed us with such a blessing that you can never be cursed. You can never be cursed. 
You're so blessed in the ma very manner of your creation that you can never be blessed. Krishna made you of light, and so darkness cannot penetrate light. So how did we get into this state of stress and anxiety? How do we come to the point where we're killing ourselves, our bodies with stress and anxiety? We forgot the Lord. We forgot the Lord. The sun is there for everyone, profuse, abundant, light streaming since millions and millions of years unlimitedly, lighting up, purifying, illuminating, making visible everything. And yet if you turn your back on the sun, you cast yourself in shadow. So Lord Brahma is describing the shadow-like existence of illusion in which the residents of this material world suffer. He says, the people of the world are embarrassed by these bodies as eternal spirit souls. You, have, you are embarrassed by birth, embarrassed by death, embarrassed by disease, and embarrassed by old age. And because of this, we're always afraid. We try to bulwark. We try to insulate ourselves against birth, death, disease, and old age by accumulating wealth, by accumulating a spouse, and children, relatives, and friends, founding a dynasty, purchasing land, hiring a security company. And yet nothing can stop cruel death from inserting itself in amongst all of that and dragging us away for punishment at the end. It is said that um, they are filled with unlawful desires, lamentation, and paraphernalia, and they anxiously base their undertakings on the perishable conceptions of my and mine. I was in Prabhupada's room in Los Angeles one evening. There used to be a karate studio down just across the alley below. It was a chiropractor during the day, and then at night he taught karate classes. His storefront faced on Venice Boulevard, and we were kind of around the corner of temples on Watsika. And there's an alley that runs between the temple and the Mason, Masonic Lodge, laundromat, and the chiropractor's office. So as Prabhupada was talking about philosophy, we heard, wafting up from below, repeatedly, Hoo! Ha! Hoo! Ha! Hoo! Ha! And after a while, Prabhupada just stopped what he was saying, lent an ear to that smile and he said they are thinking that by going who ha that when death comes when death approaches them in amongst their friends and their wealth and their uh, surroundings their security arrangement that they'll be able to say who ha and death will go away he said, but death is not so easily deterred death has never been deflected from any person any embodied person ever since the beginning of time. There has been no tactic, no strategy, no bank balance, no erudition, no family big enough to have ever deterred death since the beginning of time. Death will always infallibly, invariably claim his victims. Why? Why is death never foiled, never frustrated? Because, you guessed it, me too, Sarvaharascha. Death is God. Krishna his God. Arjuna faced a vast army at Kurukshetra. They had the best weapons. They had more soldiers. They were about 30% more in numbers than the Pandavas. They had big champions like Bhisma, Dronacharya, Ashwatthama, Duryodhana, Karna, in undefeated champions, you know, so many KOs to their credit. People didn't even last one round in the ring with them. Um, vast wealth, vast resources. They've been sitting for 13 years in the palace with the best food, the best workout equipment, the best personal trainers. <laughs> well, the Pandavas were cooling their heels out, sleeping on the ground, eating roots and berries, <laughs> wearing barks of trees during their 13 years of exile in the forest. So you would have thought that, uh, you know, the, the Kauravas with all of their 
material power, wealth, and strength would have been the ones to inflict death on the weaker, disenfranchised Pandavas. And yet death has his own marching orders. Death is none other than supreme personality of God. And in spite of the superior wealth, the superior training, the superior bodily constitutions, and the superior um, track record of the champions in the Krava army, even before the first conch shell blew, even before the first couple of swords crossed, before the first arrow was released, Krishna says, Kalo shmin loka seakri loka shamani rite bhavan yabashtito patinu. None of these big, strong, powerful, wealthy, well trained aristocratic soldiers is going home. They're, none of them are going back to their wives or children. They are all going to be tapped on the shoulder by death. And how can I say that with such confidence? Because I am death. I am the Paramatma, the super soul, seated within the hearts of all living beings. People live only as long as, by my arrangement, they can draw breath. They put themselves into the situation, unfortunately, but having placed ourselves, having suborned ourselves under the influence of material nature, for each and every one of us, death is inevitable. If you've ever been, visited cemeteries, looked at tombstones, there's always a date of birth and there's always a date of death. Have you ever gone to one of these old Civil War, Revolutionary War graveyards? You see, born 1872, dash, and then nothing. Still alive? No, there's always a date of death. Born 1764, dash, dead. 1821. Always, wherever there's the date of birth, there's always the date of death on the tombstones. Every living being who's ever taken birth has also died or will also die. Infallible, immutable, unchangeable. And that's why Yamaraj's servants, Yamadudas, thought that Yama was God. They thought Yama was God because Yama administrates the death of all living beings and death is infallible. Everybody dies. <clears throat> and so putting two and two together, the Yama Dutas had always assumed that their master was supreme because nobody can escape or flee from death. In fact, everybody in this material world, even Indra, even Brahma, lives in fear of death, and death is administrated by Yamaraj. But Yamaraj, <coughs> when the Yamadudas come back, not exactly understanding what happened in the bedroom of Ajamil, Yamaraj said to them, Paro Maranyas Jagadash and Tushtata, Otam Pratum Padabat Yatra Visham, Yaram Sato Shah, Stiti Nasha. He said, You have accepted me as the Supreme because I've administered death for so many years and death is infallible. Nobody can escape death and I'm the minister of death. I'm the representative. I'm, from me comes the personality of death and so you've accepted me as Supreme because everybody bows down before death. But I bowed, I'm just the administrator. I'm not actually death personified. That position is held by Krishna. Ritu Sarvaharashtita. Krishna orders Yamaraj to bring about the death and the punishment of all the sinful living beings within this material world. So Yamaraj is not the supreme. He's the order carrier of the supreme. And he set his servants right on that score. That the supreme is Vishnu. Even big demigods like Brahma, like Lord Shiva, Indra, Chandra, Mahavishnu, Garbhadakshai Vishnu, Siradakshai Vishnu, they're all but parts of parts of parts of parts of Vishnu, who is a fourth part of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> Krishna brings about the death of all living beings. But 
Krishna also created us originally in such a way that if we stop misidentifying with the body and take shelter of his knowledge, his instructions, and his mighty arms, we can live in such a way as to never feel the slightest tinge of fear again. The Lord Brahma continues on here saying that the biggest entrapment, the biggest snare, which pulls us down into the entangling material nature and subjects us to illusory miseries, agonies, and sufferings is this connection between a woman and a man. That Those are the shackles by which we remain in this material world. We leave the spiritual world originally and there are many different ideas, theories about why it is that we leave the spiritual world. But obviously, the point is that we <clears throat> perceived our best interests as different from the Lord. At some level, we're envious of the attention, the glory, the praise of the Lord. We wanted to be the center of attention. We wanted to find out what it would be like to have our own bank balance, our own, our own offspring, our own domain. And all this cannot have come but from an envious attitude of the Lord. And so it is envy that puts us in this material world. When you feel envy of the Lord, you are thrown, you are tossed out on your ears, so to speak, to this material world where the Lord has already prearranged everything to meet your basic necessities, nitya, nitinam, chedan, shinam. We're all dependent upon him and he doesn't begrudge us shelter. He doesn't begrudge us food. And if you want to carve out your area of influence and produce family members, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, he allows that. You, you have the license for the fulfillment of your um, material desires. But the thing to understand is that the shackles by which you remain in this material world, we're thrown into this material world. And if we had any good sense we would try to turn around and get back out of it ASAP. I've told this story several times before. There used to be a commercial by Southwest Airlines. Showed a young, attractive Afro-American girl um, with, with something in her eye, uh, having deplaned from the airport, arrived at her destination city, um, and goes into the restroom to look in the mirror and try to get this moat out of her eye. So she goes and she pushes through the way she can't see very well. So she goes into the restroom, she's standing in this big mirror, kind of pulling down and looking to try to find the moat in her eye. And then it, it, out of the corner of her eye, it, look, it comes to her attention, there's a businessman on her right hand side. She looks to the left and there's another businessman on her left hand side. And they're looking at her like, kind of like, what are you doing? here in the men's room she got through the wrong door and then the caption is wouldn't you rather be somewhere else <laughs> so if we if we had retained any sense after having fallen from the spiritual world we would have tried to cut short our say here as as much as possible just you know this gps a nice voice on the gps Whenever possible, make a U-turn. So we should have, whenever possible, made a U-turn. But why didn't we? Why, having landed in this material world, this world of birth, death, disease, and old age, this dark world, wherein the illumination is artificial, the sun and moon and stars, why in the world didn't we turn around and get giddy up on out of here? And the answer is, you guessed it, sex. Sex. Rita Anonaraj tells this funny story about someone who finds himself in a Latin American country which is ruled by tyrants. There are death squads that go through and drag people out of their houses every evening. The rivers are in the morning, their bodies floating in the river. A tropical paradise where you just drop a seed in the ground, it produces mangoes, and yet some or other due to the craziness of the dictators, there's not enough for people to eat and you're thinking, man, I gotta get out of this place. I gotta, this is hellish. I gotta get out of this place. And so you, you know, you're on your way to book your, your return flight to Miami or wherever. You're walking through a part of town and you're looking at a little hut and there's a, and all you can see is there's a, obviously a, a 
a young female in the hut and you see a little bit of ankle and a foot and it's a it's a shapely ankle the shapely ankle with some mu mu well muscled well rounded calf there sticking out from underneath her peasant dress and nice toes nice foot with nice arch it's all you see just get a little glimpse in in the end of the hut as you're passing and then what's your first thought oh, this place isn't so bad after all <laughs> is it any wonder that lord brahma says we're embarrassed to be here we're embarrassed so there are two functions of maya one is to throw and the other is to cover that's why we stay the reason we stay is because we're covered by the illusion that union with the opposite sex will make us happy it says deva maya vimoita having been thrown in this material world deva maya vimoita we remain here we settle for so much less because of the illusion that combining with the opposite sex will make me happy. And we find confirmation of this in the fifth canto, fifth verse, eighth chapter of the Bhagavatam, wherein Rishabdev says to his sons, Rishabdev is retiring and he's had a hundred sons and he's leaving all of that to take shelter of Lord Krishna and to chant holy names of the Lord in the forest. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare And he's giving some parting advice to his hundred sons. And his main thing he's saying is, yes, you came to this material for sex. Yes, you're going to get married. Yes, you're going to have children. But be very careful. The, these are the shackles by which we... Um, What's the word? Reconcile ourselves to this world of birth, death, disease, and old age. And this is why we live constantly in fear. It starts with the connection between a man and a woman. And these are the words that Rishav tendered to his sons. Pumsam striya mituni bab metam. In this material world, there's really only one pleasure, one momentary flickering pleasure. It's the reason why all living beings remain here, settle for so much less. It is sex life. Sex life is the one main pleasure by which we remain in this material world. And then having combined a man with a woman and a woman with a man and then tasted that pleasure, it is this tayur mito rizigrantu mihum. The attachment arises. Their heart strings get intertwined. And, the, and just like with a knot, you tie it. And then to make sure the knot doesn't undo itself, you pull it. You pull it so that whatever intricacies in and out and over and around and back, then it, it uh, cements it. It makes it permanent. You pull it. And the tighter you pull it, the more difficult, the more impossible it is to undo the knot. I run into this all the time. You know, by Bobby and the Lama people are always tying knots and pulling them tight. So if I want to open a piece of fence to get the ride mower through to cut the grass on the other side, I can almost never undo the knots. <laughs> they're, they're so difficult. I have to get a screwdriver and go in there and undo them or just cut the ropes all together. And so um, um, one becomes so attached. Dayatobisham pupsham sangatsayate. Sangatsayate kama krodavya. First you, you're just passing on. You see a little, you see an ankle, you see a calf. Then maybe you, you know, stop. Maybe I'll be lucky. Maybe I'll see her come out. And lo and behold, you think you're the luckiest guy in the world. She comes out with a bucket of water. She goes to the well. She pumps water. You see the action of her arms and her thin waist and all. And then you, you must up your courage. Maybe you speak a little Spanish or something. You say, hola, hola. One thing leads to another. And it all started... You're on your way to the airport to get out of that country. It all started with a glance. And then the glance became prolonged. Your glance happened to fall upon the part of the female anatomy. And instead of then looking away, it, your glance rested. It stayed there. It 
it uh, exploited. Um, and the imagination went to work. And you started imagining the dream, the plot thickens, you know, marriage, children, and before you know it, you're off and running, detoured from going back to home where everything is comfortable and the infrastructure is fine. You resigned yourself to living in this country of death and um, um, a disruption, all because of what started off as a casual glance. Dayatobisham <laughs> pumsham. You contemplate the object of the senses from contemplation to have attachment. From attachment, lust comes. You're, you're no longer uh, dispassionate. You're no longer a casual observer. I have to have this woman. I have to enjoy that body. From lust comes. And from lust, illusion. You totally forget who you are as an eternal spiritual. This is not your home. Um, it is not in your best interest to pursue the demands of the senses. So it says that illusion comes and from illusion... Uh, bewildered of memory and thus one falls down into the material pole. So it starts with that connection between a man and a woman. The knot of affection becomes tightened in such a way it cannot be undone. And the result then of that combination One has has to have a house for one's wife that's required in order to show her the proper respect. And in fact, once you do have a wife, we're not in any way suggesting that you disrespect her, that you blame her for your own entanglement. It was of your own doing. And as long as you took that step, you need to man up, accept your responsibilities and be a good husband and a good father. It's going to be at least 25 years minimum during which you have to do your duty to that woman and to that family and to those in-laws. So um, beginning from that original contact, street, the word for woman means expand. So you have house. House has to be surrounded by a little land. After all, you need a garden. You need to grow food in order to support your growing family. Sutapta to here. There will be children. There will be businesses. There will be uh, business associates. There'll be enterprises, there'll be charities to whom you donate. The result of all of that is Janisha Mahamamiti. You fall totally into illusion. Who am I? Where is my home? To where should I return? And who is my creator and my well-wishing Lord? All that's lost, tossed by the wayside. And all one can think about is Aham Mamiti. Me and mine. My self-interest and the self-interest of my family. Thus, one falls down into the material pool and remains there by one's own choice, being illusioned by a kith and kin. That's about all the time we have this afternoon. We'll talk about the means of rectification, ecstatic remedial processes of devotional service, tomorrow, but we have to lay the foundation and um, describe how essential it is that one not settle into family life because it doesn't happen just once. It's not like once and done. No. If you're attached to family life in, in your next life, you're going to get another family. In your next life, you're going to get another family. And there's no guarantee that your future families are going to be human. Everybody has a family. The birds have families. The marmots have families. The seagulls have families. The fish have families. So, yeah, you getting the idea there? Okay, we'll talk about this more tomorrow. Hey, Rob, is Kel sleeping? Can you say anything or not today? Can you that whisper anything over. or not today? Uh, he is awake this morning, so I'm I'm able to, to speak. That's... Uh, that's a powerful... Rob knows all about entanglements. Yes, I do. <laughs> and he's been uh, to that school. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm assuming Kel's sleeping and Rob can't say anything. So let's look at some of the comments. Thanks, Sorry, Natasha. Thank been with us consistently now. Appreciate that. Brent, how do you go? 
Today, today, today is Tuesday. Brett comes on Thursday. And he works all day helping around. Had tremendous help for, for Vi Bobby. Here's Vi Bobby also, in the comment section. Janatari says good morning and Hari Bol. Britta from Ogden, good morning. Hari Krishna, another good morning from Govinda. Dave, and here's some comments. Britta says we had to put a net near the edge of our koi pond at my parents' house to discourage herons. Yeah, we had a blue heron a few years ago. And, uh, you know, the seagull is annoying, but at least he just takes a small fish morning and evening, takes what he can eat. The thing that really irked me about the heron was that he would stand on the edge of the pond, blend into the surroundings, conceal himself, and then they have these long beaks, which are like javelins. And he would spear the fish. But he wouldn't just take one fish. One day we found four fish cut up horribly by his beak, just floating dead on the surface of the pond. So I don't mind that much, the seagull taking a fish or two. I, I'm still trying to figure out how to get rid of him. But the heron really bugged me because he didn't just take what he needed to eat, but he would kill unnecessarily. He would slaughter the fish, and that we have to, that we cannot, that we cannot support. We recently had to go on a campaign against the marmots. We had twenty marmots living underneath our buildings, and as long as there was one or two, we lived, we coexisted for years. But once they started reproducing, and we can't grow anything, and and even if if like for a marmot, I know where the marmot holes are. I could put a cabbage out there. I could put an offering to satisfy them, they could eat it, but no, they're not satisfied. They have to go into the garden. And when they're in the garden, they don't just eat one melon or one zucchini. They they take bites out of 20. So that, you know, that's their fatal flaw. If it weren't for that propensity to ruin multiple fruits far beyond what they would need to make, we could live happily together. But unfortunately, when you start scoring when you start ruining 20 zucchinis when you could have satisfied yourself by eating just one we have a problem somebody's got to go it's the showdown at high noon at the okay corral problem with the blue heron is that they're a protected species so you can't you can't do anything against them really and so if you look at this picture you'll see wire strung along the edge all around the edge we had to by bobby had to go to great trouble to embed um, metal posts at a 45 degree angle and then strew fishing line all so it, so the heron has no place to 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 land and stand and we also played the radio the boom box day and night so that so we don't we haven't seen the heron for a couple of years but now we've got this Seagull. I might have to go to Walmart and get a BB gun or something. Stun him once or twice. But I know what you're talking about, Britta. Thank you for that comment. Jay, good morning. Anjali. Haribo, Anjali. Yes, transcendental fear versus material fear. Gene, thanks for joining in. Yes, Lord Brahma makes all these statements because he's trying to sober us up. He's trying to... You know, we have that we're, we have that covering illusion, that yoga maya that covers us. So when Lord Brahma lays out the actual conditions of this material existence, it's very sober. And it should be an impetus uh, not to just get all down and dysfunctional and depressed, but it should be an impetus to take up spiritual practices very seriously under the guidance of an expert spiritual master. If you do that, you can achieve freedom from material entanglement. It took us millions and millions of births, millions and millions of lifetimes to get where we are, but the chanting of the holy names of the Lord and the guidance of the spiritual master is so potent and so powerful that within one lifetime, you can go back to home, back to God. All woes in this material world are temporary. Curious what the Vedic scriptures say about dreams. Yes, that's in the fifth canto. Uh, Rahugana talks about that. Indivisible, indestructible, deliver that prose, Anjali. Back to Gary, thanks for checking in. A regular, please have my own obeisance, glories to Prabhupada. Britta, 
She says, it's interesting that people have so much anxiety about the social media metaverse. It's almost like our own shadow version of this material world replete with false ego and high stakes, but it's not real. It feels real to those caught up in it, but you have to turn it off. Or just like this material world, what you're paying attention to presents itself more and more. Pay attention to misery and suffering, you get more of the same. Use the internet for Krishna, and you get more and more of him. Very good point. Very good point. I don't know how you slip into a dream, but it must be very minor, very innocuous. But but once you sign up, kind of seg into the dream, you know, start spinning out these illusions during the sleeping state, quickly develops a momentum of its own. And before you know it, you've spent who knows how much time, at least in the dream. Sometimes it seems like you've spent whole lifetime scenarios spin out that seem to span decades and decades might only be a few seconds by our daytime calculations but in the dream can go on for decades or even generations similarly it's the same thing with the metaverse which is what they like to call themselves now um, you just you just oh yeah I'll just check my Facebook page and all of a sudden it's like a half an hour later and you've gone here and you've gone there and you've seen what this person has done and you felt sadness, you felt fear, you felt anxiety, you felt, felt this, that, and the other thing. And it all just, it happened um, because of a whim and it sucked you in and developed a life of its own so fast it makes your head spin literally. And so yeah, it's a nice metaphor for our overall situation in this material world. And then again, Britta says that she spends a lot of time in the Ogden Cemetery, where there's seven generations of our family buried, puts it all in perspective. Yes, it does indeed. Anjali says, everybody bows down for death, but I'm not death personified. That is Krishna, Yamaraj, setting his servants right. Yes. Uh, wouldn't you rather be somewhere else? Anjali says. <laughs> you can probably get that on YouTube. I wouldn't be surprised if it's archived on YouTube somewhere. I'm, I can't never think of that without laughing. It's like, uh, wouldn't you rather be somewhere else? Sex life of the shackles, Anjali echoes that. It's very hard to undo the tight knot of material affection, material affinity. Yeah. It's not like we come once and done in this material world. We start, we start with a glance and then we contemplate more seriously and more prolongedly the object of our attraction, and then it becomes lust and yada, yada, yada. Laudily, thanks for joining us. She says, wonderful class, Prabhu. I love, I love that. The seagull issue makes me think of Subari, Muni, and Garuda. Good. Yes, Anjali, I know Herod is a protective species. That's why my hands were tied. That's why we played Krishna radio for three months, 24 hours a day, before he finally got the idea that he was unwanted. Okay, I hope you've had fun. I've had a lot of fun today, even though the subject matter we were talking was misery and fear. Some or other. We had a good time with it. And we're not gonna we're not gonna allow it. We're not gonna settle for that being our status quo. We're on the progressive path back to home, back to Godhead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama. <laughs>